coming up on Carolina Week. Shock, regret, disappointment in America. Students react to Donald Trump's presidential win. The votes are in, but we still don't know who will be North Carolina's next governor. The race is too close to call. And if you voted in North Carolina, you didn't have to bring a photo ID. We'll tell you why that's so controversial. All that and more, Carolina Week starts right now. From the UNC School of Journalism and Mass Communication, covering Carolina in HD, this is Carolina Week. An end to a contentious race for president. Good afternoon. I'm Jacqueline Lee. And I'm Sharon Nunn. The results are in and they show that the nation remains di deeply divided. And in a finish that sent shock waves across the country and around the world, Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump handily won the electoral vote. He gave his victory speech early this morning. Now it's time for America to bind the wounds of division. We have to get together. To all Republicans and Democrats and independents across this nation, I say it is time for us to come together as one united people. Trump says his first orders of business as president are to improve the country's infrastructure and grow the economy. The latest numbers show Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton actually won the popular vote by a little more than 200,000. But with only 228 of the 270 electoral votes needed, Clinton acknowledged her defeat this afternoon. This is painful, and it will be for a long time. But I want you to remember this. Our campaign was never about one person or even one election. It was about the country we love and about building an America that's hopeful, inclusive, and big-hearted. Many students stayed up late into the night watching the election results come in, and today on campus, it's what everyone is talking about. Reporter Katie Kamen joins us live from South Building, where she's hearing all of the reactions from the students gathered to express their disappointment. Katie. Hundreds of students gathered here this afternoon for what they called a campus walkout. Three students organized the event this morning and spread the word on Facebook. They said they wanted to give their classmates an opportunity to voice their anger, concerns, and fears about Trump's election. Clearly, lots of students wanted the opportunity to vent. And even away from the protest on other parts of the campus, students had a lot to say about the race. Honestly, I just hope, no matter who you supported, that you still stand by America and the fact that we still need to stick together. We're all Americans, we're all people. And so, no matter what happens, make sure we actually respect that. If he can actually do a good job, then I'll, then I'll be happy with him. I, it really remains to be seen what will happen though. A huge amount is up in the air. The election is laughable. It's a satire to me. It's weird, unsettling, I'm scared kind of. Shock, regret, disappointment in America, but we'll have to move on as a country. People outside of Chapel Hill might have had different ideas and that's why it kind of swung the vote. And I'm thinking that those populations are like voting for Trump and hopefully not because of like the hatred that he sh had shown in his campaign, but maybe because they're not feeling like their voice is being heard by the government and they're looking for change. So I'm hoping we can like address those problems and just kind of champion compassion and love from here on out. I talked to dozens of students today, most were Clinton supporters who were obviously upset but I did speak to a few Trump supporters who were happy the election went their way, but none of them agreed to speak on camera. Jacqueline. Katie Kamen reporting live from Wilson Library. Thanks, Katie. Trump's victory blindsided most pollsters and political commentators who had predicted the win would go to Clinton. UNC political communication professor Daniel Kreese explains how so many got it wrong. Well, usually you have many, many, many different polls uh, taken and then you aggregate uh, them all together to sort of figure out what would be the most likely uh, result of an election. Um, but I think this will force a lot of people in the coming days to um, rethink uh, their methodology for predicting uh, political events, particularly ones that might be controversial among the public. 
Now, North Carolina is a state that surprised a lot of people this election. We're joined now by Donnie Holloway. Donnie, how did how did the North Carolinians uh, vote play into this presidential race? Sure, and the votes in this state were tight. Just to give you a look at some numbers, North Carolina, a key battleground state with 15 electoral votes, certainly playing a big role in this election. 45% of North Carolinians voted for Hillary Clinton, with 51% voting supporting Donald Trump. Clinton got more than 2 million votes, but Trump about 170,000 more votes than she did. This election has some interesting historical historical implications. North Carolina was a blue state back in 2008, turned red in 2012, and now stays red. The early voting numbers showed that Trump was ahead going into election day. And when President Obama visited Chapel Hill, he said that if Hillary Clinton wins North Carolina, she wins the presidency. But he wasn't able to help her get to that number. Very true. Thanks so much, Johnny. Thanks for that insight. This election will go down in history as the most unprecedented and unpredictable election to date. Here's a look back at the top moments. April 2015. Of this national campaign. I'm running for president. June 2015. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. August 2015. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs. October 2015. Clinton testifies for nearly 11 hours on Benghazi. December 2015. It will be lifted, this ban, when and as a nation we're in a position to properly and perfectly screen these people coming into our country. July 2016. The values that you work hard for what you want in life. Except your nomination. That I accept your nomination. WikiLeaks releases DNC emails showing their hostility towards Bernie Sanders. October 2016. I moved on her like a <laughs> WikiLeaks releases transcripts of Clinton's paid campaign speeches. 11 days before the election, FBI Director James Comey says the Clinton email investigation is reopened. In November 2016, he says there is no new evidence in the emails discovered. And the winner of the presidential election... Sorry to keep you waiting. Complicated business. Complicated. Trump will take the oath of office on January 20th, 2017. Turning now to state elections, Sofia de la Guardia is live in the studio with the latest results. Sofia. Sharon, in the Senate race, we can see that Republican Richard Byrd won the re-election with 51% of the votes, while Democrat Deborah Ross came in with 45%, while this is Byrd's third term. Meanwhile, we have the governmental race, and it was way too close to call. We have Democrat Roy Cooper leading, the Repub leading Republican incumbent Pat McCrory by fewer than 5,000 votes. But we won't know who the winner is until November 18th. Officials will be checking more than 4.6 6 million votes across North Carolina's 100 counties. Even though there's no official tally, Cooper declared victory yesterday in front of a crowd in Raleigh. But McCurry isn't conceding just yet. In the race for lieutenant governor, incumbent Dan Forrest beat Democratic contender Linda Coleman. In the meantime, at the attorney general race is also uncertain. Democrat Josh Stein leads Republican Buck Newton by about 20,000 votes. A count by provisional votes will begin soon, but unless the difference falls below 10,000 votes, Newton won't be able to ask for a recount. Sharon, the election continues, at least for a few of our candidates. That's right. Thanks, Sophia. Live in the studio. A gift from two UNC alumni is giving the media and journalism school something unique. A wardrobe change. That story coming up. The presidential election is finally over. But voting controversy is far from it. Caleb Waters tells us how voter ID laws in the U.S. continue to stir up debate. It's Susan Worley. Like millions of other Americans, she voted yesterday. But did she need an ID to vote? No. No, nobody asked me for an ID. And in fact, there was a big sign up that said no voter ID required. And Worley thinks that's the way it should be. But UNC senior Matthew Harris thinks ID laws are a good thing. It's good to, I mean, prove citizenship when you come to vote. At the same time, um, I think efforts should be made to help those who may be who are perfectly qualified but struggle in actually getting an ID. No form of identification is currently required in North Carolina, but could voter laws in other states be discriminatory? This is a map of voter ID laws in the U.S. The seven blue states have the strictest laws. 
The red, orange, and yellow states have laws in place, but less strict. 18 states in D.C., here in the green, have no voter ID requirements. But what if your state does have a law? Well, that could be a problem for the 25% of blacks, 20% of Asians, or 19% of Latinos who don't have valid photo IDs. UNC political science professor Dr. Kevin McGuire says the intent of the law is what matters. If it was put in place specifically to try to keep non-whites from participating, then that would be very troubling, not only from a kind of democratic standpoint, but from a legal standpoint. Worley says the ID laws aren't just racially discriminatory. I think there's been a, a concerted effort to stop certain groups from voting, uh, including minorities and people in poverty, uh, felons. But if and how these laws affect the election is yet to be seen. In Chapel Hill, I'm Caleb Waters reporting. Now this happened because earlier this year, a judge struck down North Carolina's voter ID law. After a fire bombing on October 15th, the Orange County Republican Party headquarters officially reopened on Thursday, just days before the election. Workers moved to another suite within the same complex. Burned signs from the bombing sat on the side of the building for anyone to take. Volunteers say despite the setback, they were still able to register people to vote. The NCGOP is offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the perpetrator. Of the many big name people who campaigned in our state before Election Day, one famous North Carolinian stopped by a voting site, not to push for a candidate, but just to visit some old friends. A look upward toward bronze with folds and brushes that form the Greensboro 4 statue, which stands on North Carolina A&T's campus. And this week, it's an early voting site, too. So do you, do you typically vote here at this location? Yes. yes. But to some, this location is more than just a statue. We were all very close friends. Jesse Jackson, a civil rights leader and two-time presidential candidate, stopped by the site just to visit. No campaigning. Richardson died early on. McCain and Charlotte died last year. Uh, Isabel Blair uh, and uh, Joe McNeil, who was here yesterday, are still alive. To reflect on his friends and what they did for the country. It was a defining moment. And African American families here know Jackson and that moment well. When David Richmond, Franklin McCain, Azel Blair, and Joseph McNeil remained in their seats after being asked to leave a white-only lunch counter. It was not the first time some people sat in, but here it took off and exploded into a movement. A movement for more sit-ins across the nation and basic rights commemorated in this statue that still inspires pictures, smiles, and community. Now, Jackson has been instrumental in the Democratic Party from running from office to campaigning for others like Hillary Clinton. Moving on to other news, Chapel Hill PD has been investigating 22, that's right, 22 car break-ins since November 1st. Nearly all of the vehicles were unlocked. Not only is this a significant increase from the same time last year, but also as compared to recent months. Chapel Hill PD also released a few tips to prevent car break-ins. Number one, always lock doors and roll up windows. Number two, don't leave any valuables visible inside your vehicle. Number three, take items with you or lock them in the trunk. Well, if you have a passion for fashion, a new UNC program at our journalism school might have you so excited. The program called Workout Fashion Mash launched this fall and includes fashion-specific course and a fashion industry internship program, as well as travel and project opportunities for students. Led by Professor Dana McMahon, the program is possible because of a $1 million gift to the school from UNC alumni Bill and Lee Goodwin. Well, fall weather is in full is in full swing, rather. Falling leaves are a pretty good sign of that. We're going to fall into your five-day forecast coming up. Hi, thank you for staying with us and welcome back. I'm your meteorologist Alex Kement with your Carolina Week weather. Moving forward, our headlines, smoky morning, first freeze, and the information about the first freeze coming up in your five-day forecast. When you walk out the door this morning, you may have noticed it did smell a little bit like smoke. It wasn't your neighbor's chimney. It was actually a plume of smoke moving across the state from wildfires that were happening in western North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky. 
Moving forward to the surface map, you can see we do have this frontal boundary here, which was aiding in pushing that smoke across the state. It also brought us a few showers and some cloudy weather today. It's eventually clearing up, and that should be on out of here by tonight. If you look back to the west, you can see that we have this ton of high pressure over the western part of the country, and that's going to be making its way across and into our area for the weekend. So beautiful skies, but it will be bringing with it some cooler temperatures. As you look, that frontal system goes on off to the ocean, and then the high pressure comes in place, bringing this clear skies, sunny weather. Behind it is another frontal boundary that's going to be ushering in some super cold air this weekend, and we could potentially have our first freeze Saturday night. Zooming in, you can see that in the triangle we have upper 50s in Chapel Hill, 58 in Durham, and 56 in Raleigh. No rain that we can speak of, but we do have partly cloudy skies right now. Today, partly cloudy, we did top out around 63 degrees with light and variable winds. Those clouds are slowly clearing out and it's going to allow us to drop down to 42 tonight. We'll keep those light and variable winds. And then tomorrow, on your way out the door, we have 46 degrees at 8 a.m. We have 58 around noon and then 62 around 3. Tomorrow night, UNC goes to Durham to take on the Duke Blue Devils. For your tailgate around 5, I've got 58 degrees. We're going to cool down to 48 around kickoff at 7.30. And then for your post-game party, we've got 47 degrees. And for your five-day forecast, you can see we have mid to upper 60s for Thursday and Friday, dropping down to a high of 54 on Saturday, and then the potential for our first freeze Saturday night, but then hopefully getting a little bit warmer on Sunday. Very exciting. So Alex, when does the, t the first freeze typically happen? We're actually a couple weeks late, but that's not bad. Uh, normally the first freeze around here happens around the end of October, around the 29th, 31st. So we're about two weeks behind schedule on it, but I mean, it's... It's here. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. I don't know if, I, if you'd say finally. I don't want it. But <laughs> thank you so much, <laughs> California girl. Don't worry. It'll be too hot before you know it. And oh. you'll be like, gosh, where's winter? And it hasn't even started yet. That'll probably yeah. happen. But yeah, <laughs> thank true. you so much, Alex. Absolutely. <laughs> when Carolina Week returns, the Battle of Tobacco Road continues this week. The Hills travel to Durham, trying to dismantle the Devils and hang on to the victory bell. Carolina Week. I'm Rivers Upchurch with sports. The number 17 Tar Heel football team is taking the victory bell to Durham tomorrow night and hoping to bring it back to Chapel Hill for the third straight year. Now it's been a tough season for the Blue Devils who currently sit dead last in the ACC with an 0-5 conference record. Now Duke has kept most of its games close though including a three-point loss against Virginia Tech and a ten-point loss against Louisville. After the Devils lost last week, head coach David Cutcliffe called Duke a good team without a very good record. Now, unfortunately for Carolina, one team that does have a very good record is the Virginia Tech Hokies. For Carolina to get back to the ACC championship this year, Virginia Tech will have to lose one of its two remaining ACC games against Georgia Tech or Virginia. Now, this weekend, the Hokies host Georgia Tech, so for this weekend only, Carolina fans are going to have to root real hard for the Yellow Jackets. The women's basketball team gave Tar Heel fans something to root for as Carolina demolished Elizabeth City State on Monday. It was the Heels' last exhibition game, and what a night for this lady Heel. Stephanie Watts firing on all cylinders. Take a look here. She's going to knock down the corner three. Splash. Led the Tar Heels with 35 points, and moments later she sneaks up and gets the steal, takes it all the way, and one! Jamie Cherry shows some love for her teammate. North Carolina won 115 to 51 and will play Alabama State on Friday to start the regular season. Speaking of teams that play in Carmichael, Carolina volleyball players, they all kill, block, dig, and dominate. But four are particularly united in one special way. And as Jordan Jackson shows us, you can root for them all at the same time. If you've cheered for UNC volleyball, it's likely too you've witnessed a winning play by Taylor. Or Taylor. Or Taylor or Taylor. See a trend? That's because 21% of the team's players share the same name. Luckily, they've come up with a solution. My nickname's Frick. Um, Tito. I'm Bo. Well, a solution adopted by all but one. Some people say, like, we'll say Taylor Tracy, but I am Taylor on the court.
It's a four-person clique. Or up, the youngest of the group, uses to her advantage. They've been there for like everything that I've needed, so it's really fun to have them. And it just so happens, three of the Taylors play right on the front row. Cunningham off the block, Leaf combining oh, with number five. The triple Taylor block is really um, something that's come along this season. So like looking to my left and looking to my right and seeing another Taylor is kind of cool. We've developed like a small community bond. <laughs> amongst Taylors. A bond that's produced some incredible stats. The group's responsible for 58% of all Tar Heel kills in the season and 52% of all blocks. But Tracy adds, being a Taylor doesn't guarantee a starting lineup ticket. Whenever we go to practice or whenever we're playing games, we always have to be on our A game. We have to be competitive in order to maintain our spot. Still though, on this team, Taylor seems to equal talent. But does being one of four ever get frustrating? We all are so different from each other, that so it's not like that we all share an identity, we just share a name. So, if you're not sure whom to cheer on the next time you find yourself in Carmichael, go the safe route and root for Taylor. In Chapel Hill, I'm Jordan Jackson, reporting. In the immortal words of urban philosopher Wiz Khalifa, Taylor gang or die. <laughs> The American Volleyball Coaches Association named sophomore Taylor Leith National Player of the Week on Tuesday. She's the first Tar Heel in program history to receive the award. Okay, great culture reference, but I have to go back to football super quick. So, does Duke have any chance of beating us at our football game? Not. <laughs> Carolina is a much better football team than Duke. This would be a big upset. Uh, th there's always a chance. Duke's going to be trying to get, the, get us back for beating them 66 to 31 last year, but. Mm. They, there's, there's a chance. There's a chance. All right. Thanks. That. Thanks so much, Trevor. Thank, Thank you. We have a brand new Mrs. and Mr. UNC. Stay tuned to hear their plans surrounding Carolina's most beloved sport, basketball. To the homecoming football game, seniors campaign for Ms. and Mr. UNC. Very exciting time. Each student picks a service project to promote, and the winners receive financial and community support. Danny Nicholson is this year's Miss UNC. The mission of Discover UNC would be to pretty much bridge the gap between marginalized groups here on campus, creating safe spaces um, and bringing awareness to those safe spaces while also creating a network of allies between students, staff, administration, and faculty. Another UNC senior, Mr. UNC, is determined to give Carolina basketball fans one more reason to cheer. To complete his RA duties in Connor dorm, Logan Jin has to do something he struggled with all his life, walk. To be able to kind of walk on my own or walk with crutches has, has kind of been um, a sort of defining um, theme, I guess, in my life. Jin was born with diastrophic dwarfism, a disorder that affects bone development and his ability to do what he loves, play sports. And students with disabilities need um, access to, to recreation and sports and exercise and, and leisure and things like that too. Jin decided to run for Mr. UNC to get the funding and support he needs to start a wheelchair basketball league on campus. His campaign slogan encouraged inclusivity, we all can play. And adaptive therapies like this are sort of hard to, um, hard to find. I mean, going into the, the gym, I don't necessarily see equipment that is uh, made for me. Jin's weeks of campaigning brought him to one of the most important walks of his life at Saturday's football game. Put on my best tie and, <laughs> and my mom escorted me out on the field, um, which is pretty awesome. To I mean, your name called for uh, Mr. UNC was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. After winning Mr. UNC, Jin has already spent hours in his room planning a March Madness wheelchair basketball tournament. Stay tuned, he says, as it will be something we all can play. In Chapel Hill, I'm Aaron Wygant. Very awesome to see two minorities win Mr. and Mrs. UNC this year. I know we're all really proud of that. And to be able to give back, it really is in the spirit of the Carolina way. Mm, couldn't agree more. And that does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful night.